Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and thank you so much for every person here. I pray that you would cause this word as only you can, Lord, to come alive in our hearts. Only you can make it living. Only you can give us understanding. And for that, we call upon whom you have sent, the Holy Spirit, certainly in the name of Jesus. And uh, we're thanking you that he's in our midst to, to help us in every way. So take up together with us, Father God, here this morning to understand, comprehend that we might have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive, Father God, the things that you have for us who love you and uh, thank you for the salvation you've given us. In Jesus' name, everyone in agreement said. So we're talking about uh, going back to the future, not the old movie, if you've not been with us, but more of resetting, recalibrating some things so that in our process of going forward to the future that God does have for us, we would do it with the, the right characteristics, the right motives. And uh, sometimes you have to take a step back uh, to recalibrate or reset, maybe even call it refocusing on some things. And, and I've been talking for the last couple of weeks especially, primarily, on the matters of the heart, because your heart matters. Amen? Every heart in this room matters to God. And I want to try to share with you a little bit of insight there. And God's always dealt with his people from um, before the law, after the law, you know, whether it was Abraham before the law or after the law with Moses and then the the rest of the people, as we see in the Old Testament and then the New Testament, the Gospels, always, always dealing with the heart of his people. And I want to go to this particular verse, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, and I'll mention it. We'll come back to it towards the end. I want you all to read it out loud with me, if you would, please. Let's read. Your hearts are as hard as a field that has not been plowed, broken, softened. Oh, they put my notes in there. Um, if you change your ways, you will produce good crops. So plant the seeds of doing what is right. Then you will harvest, what is that? You're the fruit of your faithful love. It is time to turn to the Lord. When you do, he will command and he will shower his blessings on you. Say, thank you, Lord. Let me read it again without my notes there. Your hearts are as hard as, the field, as a field that has not been plowed. If you change your ways, you will produce good crops. So plant the seeds of doing what is right or righteousness. Then you will harvest the fruit of your faithful love. It is time to turn to the Lord. And when you do, he will command uh, and shower his blessings on you. Everyone say, it is time. Turn to someone and say, it's your time. I want to share this with you because we've been talking about achieving God's future, God's plan, God's best for our life. And, um, you know, sometimes we get uh, distracted. Have you ever started a project and then all of a sudden you were going to come right back and a few hours later maybe you came back and maybe you picked up right where you were but you got distracted for longer than you thought? But sometimes in life we get distracted, not with evil things, but sometimes we get distracted from uh, the focus and then maybe we lose clarity and we have to kind of recalibrate, refocus. And sometimes after a while when you start a journey or a project, you can lose the original intent and purpose or what I call the why behind the what of what you're doing. And so this is why we call this a back to the future, because in Jeremiah, the Bible does promise that God has an amazing future for us. Amen. It really does. But the question that we often have is like, well, if he has an amazing future for us. I'd like to see it sooner than later. But but this is what I want to share with you. So I've been talking about the matters of the heart and the path by which God gets us to this future that is 100 percent spiritual, 100 percent New Testament and 100 percent Jesus. And so. And it does concern the matters of the heart. So we were looking at a character. His name was Matthew. And in um, and, and Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, and it reads like this as it goes up on the screens. You might want to read it along with me. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. 
follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him and became his disciple. The asterisk in the parentheses is what I added in there. But it's within context. So we see that, for those of you who not been with us, that here is this man who's, who's typical at this particular stage. Of course, you having read the Bible, maybe knowing a, a little bit about the Bible, you understand that this is the Matthew who wrote the Bible. But more importantly, he was not that guy yet at this point. And I think it's important that you understand that, um, that Matthew is actually writing about himself. And you're going to learn a couple of things about Matthew's life and how he was discipled. And what that actually means for you and how it actually is a benefit for most people who sometimes have um, strange understandings about what discipleship is. And uh, it's everything to do with getting you to where you want to go to. Now, you have a choice, but you really don't have an option. I want to say that. What I'm about to share with you is this. You have a choice, but you really don't have an option. What does that mean, Pat? It sounds like a contradiction. Well, no. Not really. See, every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. What that means is not every person wants to be discipled because they want Christianity in their flavor. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm glad he's not talking about you and me, but I'm ready to pray for anyone else. <laughs> but here, let me, let me help you understand this, and I'll be quick, because we've been talking about Matthew from a number of different angles. I like to kind of come at it from a little different angle today. Same story, same person. Now, I love this story, this passage, and it's found throughout the Bible, but because this is the book of Matthew, Matthew is talking about Matthew, and what you're going to learn a little later on is what Jesus was actually after in the beginning when Matthew did not understand why he asked them to become his disciple. Because, see, for those of you who don't know, Matthew, as I've said before briefly, he was at the top of his game. He had the money. He had the palace. He had the ponies. He had the prestige. He had the prosperity. You know, he was working for the Roman government, which made him a traitor to the nation of Israel, though he was a Jewish man, an Israelite. So by culture, he grew up in it. But the way you and I would understand it, the way it was understood by his own people, is he turned his back on God. And he was a hated man, a hardened man, uh, a struggling man, but on the outside, he was a very prosperous man. But on the inside, he was a very poor man. And so Jesus is very intentional. Say that, intentional. Now, Jesus only had three and a half years to live, so everything he did, remember, the Bible says in the, that every morning he made it his habit to get up and pray. So there's no question that everywhere Jesus walked was with intention. He, it's not like he aimlessly just got up and aimlessly he was just going to walk in town and let's just see what happens today. No, he was very intentional. So I would like to present to you um, that in his prayer time that he knew Matthew was going to come about in his day. Just like you and I ought to always seek God every day, even if you do know who you're going to meet because you don't know what you really need to say. Thank you. But anyways, um, so Jesus is walking with intention along, and he saw a man by the name of Matthew. Say Matthew. Matthew. Jesus is also very personal. Although he wants to win the world, he also knows you as an individual. But here it's, it's important that you, and he was living in his world, his tax collector's booth. And he said, follow me and be my disciple. Now, this was not up for negotiations. Matthew was a shrewd and unethical business person. Very unethical, very immoral. He was wicked in his practices. He was skimming off the top. And that's how tax collectors were known at the day. They were just wicked. And he was doing it against his own people. That being said, you know, in the natural, he might have wanted to negotiate with Jesus. Well, you know, I got a couple of business deals to perform yet and this, that, and the other, but no. He just heard what Jesus said, and I've already explained why. 
And Jesus said, this is the path. Follow me and be my disciple. And Jesus was not moved by his, uh, his outward appearance. So he got up and he followed and became his disciple. Now, the path that we're talking about concerning our best future, our best with God, is found in the statement, follow me and be my disciple. It's called discipleship. The path of discipleship or the path that God has for us is the healthiest, fullest, most joyful path that God has for us. The Bible says when God lays out a path for you, that it is one, like it says in Psalm 65, 11, paths that drip with his abundance. David often prayed, Lord, teach me your path. Teach me. Disciple me. Help me learn how to walk your path. Being a Christian doesn't mean we know how to be a disciple. But I, I want us to understand a, a couple of simple things here. So Jesus, Jesus knew exactly why he came to Matthew. It wasn't because of all the things that were going on in the outside. In fact, if you were to look at it from the outside, you would think that, Jesus, you might have picked the wrong person because if ever there was, as it says in the Message Bible, a scum of the earth, this would be the guy. This would be the guy. He hangs out with the lowest of the lowest of the parasites. And... He is that way in his thoughts. He is that way in his practices. He is that way. He is absolutely everything that would not qualify him to even be a quote-unquote follower of Jesus. But remember, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, that although man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the what? The heart. The heart. It's a matter of the heart. See, the issue with Matthew and like. Not only are you and I considered to be this Matthew, where God finds us and how God develops us and builds us, is through the pathway of discipleship. But not only was Matthew called to be a disciple, but he was called to be a disciple maker. And a disciple maker is someone who helps other people because they themselves have been helped. Who helps other people break out because they have broken through. Who helps other people get healed because they know what healing is all about. Helps other people be comforted by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the living word, by the, and through the lordship of Jesus. But because it's, they've experienced it. It's not philosophy. It's not theory. It's reality. Yeah. <clears throat> and what's most important that you need to understand is this, family. Is the one verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12 in the, in the Message Bible. It says, the heart regulates the hands. Now, listen, I'm, I'm like you. You're looking at this Matthew. Now, you have to understand, you can't look at him as the writer of the book of Matthew when you're reading this verse. You have to look at him in his B.C. days, his before Christ days. Y'all had those. Y'all know that. You know, when you lived with the tribe of the heathens, the heathenites. Y'all don't get it. At this point, Matthew's heart was the focus of Jesus because the heart is what matters to Jesus. If you can't change the heart, you can't change the lifestyle. Religion has come across and has pounded people for their lifestyles, pounded them for their wicked works, pounded them because they don't have the right attitude, pounded them and put rules and regulations on them, and they still don't change because religion can't change you, but a relationship can. But let me, let me help you to understand that. Jesus knew the wickedness of Matthew in this point. He knew he was a thief. He knew he was scrupulous. He knew that he was unethical. He knew he was immoral. He knew he threw parties at night. So here's what I want you to understand. But what was Jesus after? It wasn't after his money. It wasn't after his title. You know, he wasn't saying, you know, Matthew, you're going to have to change your attitude before you follow me because i got a reputation to keep. I'm Jesus. He didn't say, you know, you're going to have to change your bad business practices before you follow me because now Jesus knew that the only way Matthew or you and I can ever change 
anything on the outside is to understand that we live first out of the inside. You live from the inside out. Matthew did not understand that. The scripture is the heart regulates the hands. The hands would be synonymous or symbolic of the productivity or the results of your life, your skill sets that you tend to use. The things you put your hands not literally on, but also figuratively. But it's the heart that regulates the hands. Most people, before they're believers even know that the heart matters and sometimes even after born again they think that the heart issues is only about getting saved or asking Jesus to come into their life when your entire life revolves around the condition of your heart and most people once they get saved never deal with the condition of their heart in a major way as if it doesn't need to be dealt with well the preacher started preaching and um so let me, let me help you to understand it the way Matthew said. Because Matthew, when he said, when he got up, I don't know whether he got up because he was an opportunist. I don't know, like there are people that are just, they just jump on every opportunity and they don't even know why they accepted it. Well, they said it was for free. And, and, and so, but he didn't know one thing about discipleship. He didn't know one thing about following Jesus. He didn't have any friends in that category of life. Nobody wanted to associate with him, let alone the disciples at that time. They were still being a project to be worked on. Right? And he was living, here's this guy living in his own world, and then Jesus says, follow me and be my disciple. While in the original language, he knew that following him and being a disciple is allow me to teach you to have the life that you've always desired, but you can never have without me. And so, he says, follow me and be my disciple. That's the pathway, discipleship. Now, immediately, some Christians go like, ah, discipleship. That sounds rough. That sounds like perfection. Well, it's where you get perfected, but you're never perfect. Matthew was completely imperfect. His mind was not renewed. His practices has not, I mean, he just got up and started following him. He had no understanding of what he was, what was about ready to happen, or I should say the process of, but something captured his heart because he knew that he had a life, but it wasn't fulfilling. It's because Matthew had built his life the way so many of us do prior to Jesus, even after in some cases, by trying to make what's on the inside of us joyful and happy by getting things on the outside of us. There's nothing wrong with the houses and the cars and the things that you want to do, but that is temporary, so temporary. In Hawaii, everything rusts. Right? Yeah. And then the moths come in, they eat all the clothes. You know the whole thing. You know the story. But the thing is, the principle that Matthew learned that changed the things that everyone told Matthew would never be able to change, that maybe Matthew even believed couldn't change, was something that Jesus taught now, before I share with you what it is, remember when Jesus said, Matthew, follow me, be my disciple. He got up and he followed him, but he didn't know the process. One of the processes, of course, is allowing Jesus to teach you, and Jesus is the living word, right? Okay, thank you for the one right. And then what's the next thing he did? He put him in a group of 12. He put him in a, what you and I would call well, a group of 12, a small group. What we call here in Hawaii, here in Hawaii, here at we're life, life groups. Not a program. It's a pathway for the best lifestyle that God has for you. Well, I don't want that. Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Because here is an imperfect person with imperfect ways, horrible habits, and Jesus didn't address any of that. Because if you can't win the heart, you can't change the life. If you don't surrender your heart, nothing that you want to change will ever change. You might be struggling with things on the outside, you might be, but until God has you on the inside. And I'm not just talking about saying, yes, I accept Jesus. That is an amazing start. That's the open door for living a new life. But to see that life fulfilled, 
is to follow Jesus and be his what? Right. But, um, and discipleship is out of relationship. It's not an obligation, a weight, a heavy, a, a burden to carry. No. It's a devotion of the heart. It's about heart devotion, not self-perfection. We live in a world where we are always trying to perform to be accepted. Jesus wants your heart simply to be devoted. Devotion doesn't mean perfection. For example, when I married my wife, you all know the story. When I married my wife, I was truly in love, still am to this day. But listen, I did not know how to be a husband. I did not know how to treat a woman. I did not know how to deal with the female species <laughs> prior to this. And a lot of people, you be careful, those of you who are single and want to get in a relationship. There's baggage on either side. And in the initial stages of romance, you can get so swept away that you lose sight of what you ought to be focusing on. Is this really the right person? Because my heart flutters so much that you're blind. Your fluttering heart doesn't make it the will of God. But for another time. But see, there's baggage. Well, I had so much baggage. I moved it all in with Kuna. She hardly had any, but I had a whole lot. So I filled the room. Anyways, so I was madly in love with her. Really, really was. But I did not know how to love her, how to embrace her, how to be tender with her. I didn't grow up that way. I, and, and, and for the longest time, it was my excuse. I did not know how to be a husband. Yes, I was married. Yes, I said, we do. Yes, forever after, or ever, Amber, whatever, it's, whatever you say, I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to trivialize it. Something like that. It's forever something. And... Uh, Forever Jesus. That's no, no. And then when we had children, well, I love my first daughter, second, third, fourth. We stopped because we didn't think it was just going to keep on going with girls. We thought, no, I'm just kidding. But I didn't know how to be a father. I didn't know how to love a child because I was not loved as a child. And I had this baggage, and I didn't know how come I had the hardest time just loving somebody as beautiful as, as my daughter. I just, I, did, I didn't know, you know, I didn't want to hold them. It was, it was a, you know, the, the world I live is a, it's not macho. I mean, it's not now, and it's not everybody. And it's not, my world isn't everybody's world. But I didn't know how to connect. I knew I had a problem. I just didn't know how to fix it. And so, you know, it's like, okay, you guys know, some of you who grew up playing athletics, you had a passion, a love. You were devoted to that particular sport or athletic pursuit. But when you started, even though you had devotion, you didn't have the perfection. So it wasn't about being perfect, it was about being devoted. And your coach said, you know, you have great heart, keep on going, you know, and he worked on your perfection in that particular. Some of you made, you know, the starting teams, basketball in different areas, and wonderful. But, but you, did, you weren't always that way. You grew into that because you had a hard devotion, not just outward perfection, right? Yeah. So when I talk about discipleship, discipleship is about heart devotion to Jesus, not just about work perfection for Jesus. And here's the point that I'm trying to share. Matthew was a bag of issues. The brother should have invented the the brand tissues because he had a lot of he really did no, it's, but Jesus didn't judge him he didn't criticize him he didn't call him out for his practices he didn't um, straighten him out first and neither are we when we are going to invite three people to come to our Easter weekend or, or in any service because we're going to pray who God will put on our heart so that we can pray for them. I don't want you to be frivolous and just say, oh, I got three names. And you're never going to pray about them and never really going to intercede for them. Jesus, with his compassion, 
look through all the things that stumble most Christians. Oh, he still cusses. Oh, he still vile. Oh, he still this. Oh, he still that. Yeah, they are. And they're going to continue to be until you can reach the heart. Cla uh, example. Before I move on, I just want to get you into some of this. There's a lot of people, not everybody, there's a, many, many, too many people that are caught doing things wrong in our society, right? And they go to prison. And sometimes they go to prison for a long time. And uh, justified or however it is, but then they get out of prison and they have the same habits. And sometimes it reoccurs and they go back to prison. Why? Because they got in trouble, got caught, did wrong, and they went to prison by law for the things they did on the outside. But even though they got incarcerated, many of them never changed what was on the inside. And the principle of life for all of you that are young in the Lord, senior in the Lord, this is what changes your world, the teachings of Jesus. Not just the teachings of Jesus, that sounds very general. But what Jesus taught Matthew, who came from the worst of positions. And, um, and I want you to see this. It's a matter of the heart. Again, I say the heart regulate. The word regulate means controls, navigates, um, directs the hands. So my heart influences the outcome of my life. You said, no, 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 that's not what I'm taught. No, you're taught that everything is about your brain. Some of you don't even know whether you have one. But they told you in biology class, it's up there. And so we all believe it. Even me. I know something's up there. Because someone told me. But, that being said, although it's important to educate and develop your mind, your will, and your emotions. And that is, takes the power of God. But you need to understand the principle of your life is the heart regulates the hands. You don't change the heart, you don't change the outcome of the hands. You can't change the heart, you won't change behaviors. You won't change lifestyles. You won't change mentalities and attitudes and perspectives. And you, they won't be able to grasp vision and dream dreams because it's all an element of the heart. The heart regulates the hands. And I like it the way it says in one translation. That's why the Bible says you've got to guard your heart because the enemy is a contaminator. Oh, you're listening way too slow. What happened? And it says in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Your heart determines the course of your life. Not the course of your life between just heaven, going to heaven. Yes, of course. You've got to be born again, Jesus said. Absolutely. But the course of your life on this side of glory. And we can't always see what we need to see. So that we can be who Jesus says we ought to be. Living the abundant life. Living with joy. Living with that peace. Living with that strength. Living with that comfort of the Holy Spirit. Living in good relationships. Having a good marriage. That's an issue of the heart. You'll never, ever have a good relationship unless you have a transparent and vulnerable heart. And I'm going to help you get there. It's every Christian's responsibility to be a disciple. It's every Christian's, play on words, response hyphen ability. You have the ability to respond to be a disciple. I'll help you to do that in just a second. Before I do that, let me share with you Matthew's historia story. And um, if you have... Well, it's going to go up on the screens. So, later, after Matthew got up, followed Jesus. That's Matthew following Jesus. And got involved in the life group. 
Once Jesus, listen to this, once Jesus selected his 12, his small group, what you begin to read in the Gospels, he would preach to the crowds, the multitudes. But those were lessons for the disciples. Many of those lessons he taught, Jesus did, to his disciples that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pinned down. They learned in that small group setting. They learned as a disciple. And one of the most transforming lessons that Matthew ever heard was how a man lives from the inside out, from his heart. Matthew was that guy that everyone said could not change. Was his, his heart was as hard as stone can be. He was as evil and despised from the entire nation for being a tax collector. How can they go from that place in three and a half years plus to, to writing the gospel of Matthew? Being a follower and a disciple of Jesus. But let me tell you, what, it's not just that alone. It's what goes in that. Matters of the heart. Your heart matters. See, everyone in this room has shortcomings, gosh, weaknesses, flaws, my gosh, imperfections. I know I'm preaching it <laughs> to myself, probably. And, and I get it, and I get it, and he's right. We all feel that. And there's little, little thoughts that I feel so unqualified. How can I be a disciple? I can't be a disciple. But that's exactly who Matthew was. That's why his story is there. Not because he was the gospel writer, Matthew. But when you read the book of Matthew, you're actually reading what took place in Matthew's heart as he was being discipled by Jesus. And one of the lessons is found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Now, he's reiterating what Jesus said because it's what Jesus discipled him in. And it so captured his heart that he wrote it this way like no other of the four Gospels. Because of time, verse 33, it says, Either make the tree good. I mean, no, he's not talking about botany here horticultural, things like that. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. He's not talking about the pious here. He's talking about a life can change by making a choice. He's talking about how your fruit, you say, well, you can't judge me. No, watch, this passage is going to show you something. I, I don't, people always say that, well, you can't judge what's in my heart. No, you can judge yourself. I don't, and we don't, want to be judges of anybody. Don't judge, lest you be judged. Don't want that coming my way. But... It goes on in the next verse, and it says, Brood of vipers, <laughs> snakes, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you speak worry, anxiety, fear, doubt, uh, negativity, unbelief, your heart. You can't judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm just hearing you. Now, as much as you want to justify anxiety... Worry is sin. Anxiety opens the door to depression. That's why the Bible says, don't be anxious. Now, I'm not, I'm not here trying to harp on anything. But see, this is the lesson. Matthew was as evil as they came. And his fruit, although he was prosperous, he got it in very scrupulous ways. He was very flawed. He was an evil practitioner of business and commerce. He was a thief. And the friends he had were a fruit of his heart. And the outcome that he had and the lack of happiness that he had, he didn't understand this. He didn't comprehend it. 
Maybe he defected from Israel from being a Jew because he wanted money because he thought, if I get enough money and I can get enough titles and if I can just make it up the ladder, I will be happy. The moment you think money and titles makes you happy, you're dealing with an idol. Some people will sell out their God for money and title. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't prosper you, doesn't want you well, doesn't want you. Of course he does. But Matthew is talking about not just how to change a person's life, the fruit of a person's life. You don't have to stay angry. You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be offended. You don't have to be mad for the rest of your life for what somebody or your family or whoever did to you. You don't. You're not in prison. The good news is you're not in prison. He came to set the captives free. I was captive one day, but the Son of God came and he set me free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so Matthew is giving you an insight not only of what Jesus said, but what struck him the most because he was that vile person. I mean, think about the people that Jesus had on his team, my gosh. We won't even go down that list, but that's, I mean, he had Peter, he had the hoof and mouth disease. He always put his foot in his mouth. <laughs> Bad joke, old days. Verse 35 of the same passage. A good man of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. Peter is listening, Peter, sorry. Matthew is listening to this He's pinning this because it's what Jesus taught, but it's what transformed him. He always thought the money and the title, even though I have to sell out my nation and work for the Roman Empire, even though they treated our people bad and I forsook God and I got hard-hearted, those things, I was always mad, I was always bitter. Nobody wanted to be my friends except for the scum of the earth. I knew why they were coming over. They wanted my money. They wanted my goods. That's all they wanted. They didn't want my friends. They didn't want my heart. He knew all of that, but he didn't know how to change it. But when Jesus came to him, he said, follow me and be my disciple. I'll put you on that path of fulfilling God's vision, your best life. And, and he began to learn this simple principle. A person, man or woman, a person out of the treasure of their heart brings forth things, their life. Not things transforms your heart, but your heart transforms the things around you. Jesus is talking about living from the inside out. Matthew never thought that way. Matthew did not know that. But Matthew began to learn that. And he began to hear the words of Jesus. Every Christian's responsibility is to be a disciple. I should not have to separate Christian and disciple. But in our day and age, Christians are wondering whether I should be a disciple. It's a choice, but it's really not your option. Because Jesus only asked disciples, only work dealt with, and had following him disciples. Here are the four abilities that you have in being a disciple. The first one, and they all come with a little test, is what I call the agreeability test. I made it up. Um, the agreeability test. Can you say that? The agreeability test? Well, Bible says in Amos 3.3, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? The opposite of agreement is division. You both can't have equal standards, you and Jesus. He is the standard setter, we agree. Hmm. Can you pass the agreeability test when his word says, forgive? I agree with your word even though my feelings are every which way but right. 
Can you pass the agreeability test when he said, you know, repent from strife? It's not how I feel. I don't feel, but if that's what your word says, I'm going to agree with you because I want to walk together with you. When he said, follow me, be my disciple, follow me, walk next to me. You can't disagree with him and follow him. I mean, he'll never leave you nor forsake, but I'm talking about this, and this is what I want. Oh, gosh, I have so much to say. Turn up the dial on your hearing. The whole goal of discipleship, and I'll say it again and again and again until you get it, till we get it, till I get it, is to promote your progress and your joy in believing in Christ. If I don't have someone speaking into my life, I could accept little flaws, little foxes, that begin to take my joy away. So many people who have lost their Christianity, per se, fallen away from the Lord because they lost their joy. No one's going to talk to me. I have a relationship with Jesus. Well, I'm sure you do, and I'm glad of it, and I'm sure it's very real, but that's not what the Bible says. You need to be disciples. So I need a brother or a sister, normally it's my wife, that tells me, you know, you shouldn't be offended. You shouldn't be hurt. You need to go to your daughter and repent. And even though I go like this, and I get upset, I do it. Why? Because it's going to keep my joy in believing. And most people, when you don't, when you aren't, how would I say, transparent, you have the opportunity to become stagnant. Because you can't always see by yourself because you're so, what is it, what do they say? I can't see the trees because of the forest or I can't see the forest because of the trees. You're so close to everything, sometimes you don't see what someone just on the outside of you, a good friend, an honest friend, a genuine friend, can see. Say, you know what, it's not good for you to carry strife. I don't care what your mother did or how she's treating you, you can't walk in strife. You've got to walk in love. That keeps the joy and believing in Christ. So many people, you know, don't want to be spoken into. Mm. And then there is, I wish I had time to break that one down. Then there is the, what I call the pliability test. Are you pliable? Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not snap. Is my little thought on that one. The pliability test. There are some people that are so rigid, rah, they're as stiff as a board. They're like concrete, all mixed up and so well set. But I want you to understand, that was a joke, you missed it. But anyways, the pliability test is not about being rigid or dogmatic. This is the way I've seen it, it's the only way I've ever done it. And I'm not talking about violating scripture. Please. But it takes the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. It takes the living word of God. It's not rules and laws and harshness it's life and it takes like i said an honest friend that has a standard that will keep you healthy because discipleship is about promoting your progress in your family marriage personal walk with christ finance it's in all things and your joy in believing in Christ. If you're losing your joy, you're becoming weary. Sometimes there's little foxes and, you know, we just be so guarded all the time. It's not going through the motions. I wish I had more time, but... Then there's the prunability test. I didn't call you a prune. I said the prunability test. Are you prunable? Ask your neighbor, are you prunable? <laughs> didn't ask him whether they like prunes. Jesus said... In John 15, 2, it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Okay. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Ouch. That it may bear more fruit. You know, it's interesting how God prunes. God prunes often with my spouse. Well, it's better than Balaam. He had a donkey. But 
God will use people to help you life, even though you don't understand how they're helping you at times. Are you prunable? Or are you defensive? Can you give up your Isaac? Or this is my Isaac. This is it. He knows it. He knows the motive. You're trying so hard to make this thing happen. You're strangling it. And you're hurting others around you. And you don't see it. Because you want it your way. Pruning is about sacrifice. My, my uncle had a, we had a peach tree and he came over one day and he said he's going to prune our tree. I mean, it was like, it had like nice, the season before it had like blossoms and then it had some, some, um, some peaches obviously that came on it. But when he came and pruned it, he like, it went, I mean, it looked like that. I mean, literally it was just a stick with little things sticking up. Like, what'd you do, Theo? Theo is uncle in Spanish. So what'd you do? He says, I pruned it. I said, no, you didn't, you killed it. You know? He says, no, I pruned. The, I said, but that was, it was growing. He says, yeah, but if you wanted to grow more fruit, you have to prune it. Now, I didn't understand it. I was younger at the time, but it's true. When the season did come, it blossomed. We had more fruit, more peaches, and my mother didn't even know how to make peach cobbler. It was a shame. But anyways, the point I'm trying to share with you is that it, we had more peaches than ever before. It was amazing. And, and the thing is this, can God cut away even though you think everything's okay? Because he says, those branches that are, some of us don't want to go to prayer and say, God, here is my Isaac. If you want it, you can have it. He said, I dare not go. He might ask for it. <laughs> if he did, it would only be because of your heart. Not to hurt, but to heal. Because some of us want to jump in a relationship, like I said earlier, and we have baggage that we're not taking care of. And we just think that another relationship is going to fix all the issues it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because the, the strength of your relationship is not in the power of her. And the strength of your completeness is not in the power of him or her. It's in the power of him. And if him or her is so much upon you that he is not... So, are we prunable? Hey, let's move on to a happier thought. <laughs> then there is the shapeable test. Shapeability, I call it. Can God form you to be the husband, be the father, to be the pastor, yes, even me, to be the leader, to be the man, to be the friend that he wants me to be? Can he form me? Yes, he can. Yes, I'm willing anyway. Isaiah said, still, eternal one, you are our father, and we are just clay. You are the potter. We are the product of your creative action. Oh, I love this. Shaped and formed into something of worth. And we must be shapeable. The Bible says in Jeremiah 18 like clay in a potter's wheel, I, God, will shape you and your destiny. And I think it's a different translation. And sometimes, would you please stand to your feet because I have to close. And my goal here this morning was multifaceted. My ultimate goal here is that when um, this Easter weekend comes, it would not be a weekend that comes because that weekend can come and go and none of our hearts will necessarily be changed unless we start that process right now. I mean, in your devotional life, in your walk with God, and that's what I want to do. I really want to see you experience the greatest future, the greatest life that God has for you, the best life you will ever have is being a disciple of His. And um, when it comes to praying, this is a prayer card where we're praying for three. And meaning 
when you begin to pray for three that um, you'll sense that God's putting on your heart and maybe invite to the Easter weekend that we have for families as well as the production, but for families as well. Um, we want to pray for them, not just invite them. And the people that he might put on your heart might be people that aren't quite perfect yet. But if he puts them on your heart, then pray for them from your heart and let God begin to change their heart because you have an open heart to God. And this, you know, we're asking people if they want to pick up two cards, they can. One, maybe next week you can start doing it after you pray this week with us who the names are, one you can always carry with you. The other one we're going to ask, you might want to put it in the back and we'll pray starting next week collectively we'll pray for the people that you're also praying for on a daily basis but think about who these people would be and they may be a matthew they may be a matthew please because a lot of us couldn't understand that because a lot of us were matthews uh, maybe we didn't have the kind of the coarse lifestyle that this matthew had Think about it. If God puts that person on your heart, you may be the only person that's praying for that person in this entire city, in this entire state, in this entire nation, maybe the world. I'm trying to be dramatic. Think about it. God puts people on our hearts so that we can pray for them. God knows that our Easter weekend is an opportunity for a story to be told that will touch their hearts. But the only way God's really going to touch your hearts is if we start praying for them way before. Soften up. I never got back to that verse that I started with. We'll get there. But the whole idea is, I know there's people on your heart. Maybe a friend, maybe somebody that you're um, well acquainted with. And they still really difficult. Well, let me remind you that at the point that we find Matthew's story, Matthew 9, he had walked away from God. There was no God in his life. He was embittered. He was angry. And that didn't stop Jesus from reaching out to him. Who may God put on your heart? Yeah. So don't be moved by their antics, <laughs> their language, ooh, choice, or, you know, other activities. But when you begin to pray for them, you may be surprised, and you will be surprised as how they respond when that time comes that you do invite them. And we're going to teach you how to, to do that. I hope you can join with us this week at some point. We'll teach you every now and then. We don't just pray. We do take some moments and teach how to intercede because it is new for a lot of people. We like to share with them how to do it because um, we want to we wanna see people transform the way you were transformed. Amen? So just um, bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment here. Father, I want to thank you so much. For what only you can do in the great state of Hawaii, the nation, and the entire globe. Father, when it comes to praying for people... to hear what you're all about. There's often great opposition on that person's life. We ask, Lord, that you would please open our hearts and put on our hearts, Lord, those people you want us to, to pray and intercede for. Father, we'll take it somberly and seriously and we'll trust you, Father, for the transformation of hearts. Lord, there was a day that we were once that Matthew. Lord, help us to see as you see. Help us to see through your eyes, people. Lord, that we would not be the critics, the judges, the condemners, the accusers in any way. 
the heart regulates the hands. Every heart, Lord, we know. On this earth, those that don't know you, and even some of those that do, are walking with broken hearts, scarred hearts, hurting hearts, damaged hearts, marred, flawed, injured, pained in some way. Help us, Father, to reach humanity. Not for the sake of a production, not for the sake of one weekend, but because you put love in our heart for them. Whether they be family members that we're so acquainted with, friends that we work alongside with, associates, whomever it is, Lord, our hearts will be open. And now, Father, I pray that you would, as Paul prayed, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear. Give us a heart to receive what you want out of our lives. Help us, Lord, to walk the pathway of discipleship with you out of relationship. Help us to be more open and transparent, more vulnerable, and yet free and joyful. Lord, I believe our commitment here today is to be a follower, not in word only, but in truth. A disciple of yours. Help us to bring change, Father God, to this great state that you've placed us in. Help us to grow to be more like you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come now, as you already dwell here, and minister to our hearts and strengthen our lives. Father, I pronounce your blessing over every person. And Lord, I pray now that you would do what you have eternally said would be done and we would open our hearts to you and you work in our lives. Revive your church. Awaken our hearts. And Father, we, we pursue you with an expectation Fill your people, Father God, with that joy and that strength that is 100%, Father God, a follower and disciple of yours. Lord, today we simply surrender and give our lives to you and thank you for all that you're doing in us and through us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap. Amen.